Hi, my name is Bob Nielsen. I'm an Extension Specialist and Professor of Agronomy at Purdue University. This is a recording of a seminar that I gave the department via Zoom in late November of 2021. In this seminar, I share my experiences with agronomic extension and research as a campus extension specialist over the course of nearly 40 years at Purdue University. What I would like to cover for today um, is a little bit about extension and its role at a land-grant university. Um, I'll share a little bit about the approach I've taken to doing crops extension and research over a nearly 40-year career. And then finally, share some of my thoughts and views about crops extension in particular, extension to a general degree, but crops extension in particular and research in the future and in terms of relevance and challenges that we may face uh, going forward. So extension is, of course, one of the uh, three main missions at Purdue. Land-grant universities in the U.S. have a fairly unique threefold responsibility to their state stakeholders, and that includes the three missions of teaching, research, and extension. And extension has quite a long history in the U.S., uh, acts, several acts of Congress uh, had a role in creating extension, and it was informally encouraged by the initial Morrill Act of 1862 that uh, provided the path towards the establishment of land-grant universities, uh, followed by the Hatch Act of 1887, which uh, enabled the experiment stations, and then the second Morrill Act of 1890 that led to the creation of the Black 1890 uh, schools around the country. But it was the Smith-Lever Act of uh, 1914 that formalized the creation of what was known as the Cooperative Extension Service. And it was formalized as a cooperative effort between the USDA and these somewhat new land-grant universities uh, that had been enabled back in the, in the mid-1800s. And in the language of the Smith-Lever Act, I... I often go back to it because it, it certainly has impacted how I approach extension uh, during my years at Purdue. And so these are just some paraphrases from the wording of the Smith-Lever Act of 1914 about cooperative agricultural extension. And, and it said that extension work will consist of the development of practical applications of research knowledge, and giving of instruction and practical demonstrations of existing or improved practices or technologies to people who are not attending the land-grant universities. And furthermore, to impart the information on those said subjects in connection with the foregoing and the, you know, the beautiful language of a congressional act. But this really laid the groundwork for what we do in extension. And frankly, I think it still does. And, and that will, I think that opinion will come out as, as we go through the rest of, of this presentation. Um, I tend to be idealistic about uh, extension and what it is we do, and I really do keep in mind that the name of the organization is Cooperative Extension Service, because I really believe that extension is indeed all about service to our clientele. And in my mind, this service part of extension means listening and responding to our clientele's problems. Uh, very importantly, holding conversations with those clientele at their level, not from the ivory tower of Purdue University, but being able to impart this knowledge that we're supposed to impart at a level that our clientele can easily understand and appreciate. And service also means addressing problems that are relevant to our clientele. And we do that by conducting relevant research to develop answers that, in turn, are relevant to our clientele. And then finally, of course, extension service is about getting, those, getting the information, getting the results of what we do out to our clientele. So extension is very much a service organization. And maybe to a certain degree, this differs a little bit from the other missions of a land-grant university uh, because we're responsible to our clientele throughout the entire state and providing the kind of service that helps them improve 
uh, their uh, own profitability, their own situation in life. And, and so it, it has held really deep meaning for me over all these years. Now, when I started out as a youngster uh, back in the 80s with Eileen and a few others in the department, I will admit there were times that I wasn't too sure if I was getting my message across. And this photo from the Journal Courier back in 1988 during the big drought of that year if you look closely at those farmers on the wagon, you know, I'm not sure they were really listening to me. And and as a young extension specialist, that really bothered me. And then I was, I think I was talking to Gary Steinhardt one day in the hallway about this. And Gary had been around for a few more years than, than I. And Gary reminded me, and, and I'll share this Steinism with you all because we all know how good Gary is with these Steinisms. But Gary reminded me that uh, in extension, we provide knowledge to those who often don't know they need it. And so I've tried to remember that all these years whenever I've done extension field days or extension meetings in the wintertime and, you know, people sit in their chairs and maybe have the expressions that these fellows do on this wagon that, you know, I'm not too sure if they're really listening, but, you know, that's part of our job is we're there to provide information. We do not require that they follow the guidelines we give them. We don't necessarily expect them to follow the guidelines we give them. We're trying to give them information that will help them make better decisions. Now, the, the problem we have today is that we can't, we have this thing called the internet and we shouldn't believe everything, at least according to Abraham Lincoln, we shouldn't believe everything we read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. And as the years have gone by, this challenge uh, of discerning facts for our clientele has gotten harder. And if you think about society, it's not just farmers and the agricultural uh, clientele of the state, but we are all bombarded with so-called facts and, and things that are a little hard to believe. They're hard to discern. And, and it becomes a real challenge for us as we deal with our clientele. So much of what Extension does today is to challenge alternative facts. Uh, we help our clientele improve their ability to be critical thinkers. And, you know, President Daniels told us several years ago that we need to be doing a better job with that. Uh, with our students here on campus, and we need to be just as faithful about helping our clientele improve those skills, because if they improve those critical thinking skills, then that's going to help them make better decisions by teaching them how to distinguish factual from what I call craptual information, or in other words, you know, how do they separate facts from alternative facts and misinformation and things that you know maybe aren't totally wrong, but they're not totally right either. And, and that's a big part of what we do anymore in extension is not only share the results of the research we've done on problems or issues that are important to them, but also to help them be critical about how they interpret other information they get from other sources. And so that's a lot of what I've done over the years with my stakeholders around the state. Now, extension also responds to crises. And again, I think this is a little different than the missions of teaching and research at the university because we're responsible to our clientele out in the state. And when stuff hits the fan, extension usually rises to the occasion. And often, uh, extension service is at its best when we are responding to these uh, catastrophes in the agricultural world. And and, you know, I, I think maybe this is sort of a morbid way to think of it, but uh, I think some of the best teamwork that I've been involved with over the years has been when we've pulled together in times to address some really serious uh, weather-related or pest-related issues around the state, or even just the uh, uh, serious economic times. I mean, we're facing one right now with a dramatic increase in uh, inputs of almost every sort to to a degree that we haven't seen for a long time. And so, you know, this coming year, the uh, economy for our farming clientele is going to be extremely challenging. And I would dare say that extension will rise to the occasion again as a team and, and help folks respond to that crisis. Now, as Eileen said, I arrived in, at Purdue in the fall of 1982. 
Uh, this graph is showing Indiana corn yields from beginning in 1956 through uh, this year. Uh, the red years are the years that I consider to be these calamitous agricultural kinds of situations. Uh, we had four severe droughts beginning uh, the year after I arrived uh, in 1983, 1988, 1991, 1995, where statewide yields dropped like a rock. We had the mother of all droughts in, in 2012. Uh, 1992, those of you that were around at this point in time, you remember we had our agronomy farm field day. Uh, I want to say it was like the 20th of June in, in that year of 1992, and it was Oh, I think it was in the mid-90s with just terrible winds out of the south, a searing hot winds. And the next day or two days later, we had a killing freeze that just destroyed thousands of acres around the state. And so, you know, we responded by coming together and, and going out and helping our clientele determine how they're going to deal with a kind of a killer June freeze. Uh, 2002 was an ice age season, a very cool summer that had big ramifications on crop production. Uh, 2009 was a pretty good yielding year. Technically, we were above trend yield in 2009, but it was a, just a terrible late wet harvest that led to a lot of moldy grain, a lot of issues with mycotoxins. Um, and then in 2019, only two years ago, we had a record-breaking late planting across the state. Uh, much of the crop was planted after the 1st of June. Um, and I don't know if all these disasters are because I arrived at Purdue in 1982, but the point is these major weather crises demand a lot of attention from extension specialists and, and extension educators uh, to respond to the information needs of our clientele. And frankly, when these kinds of situations develop, extension pretty much has to drop almost everything and put their focus on and attention on responding to these uh, needs of our clientele when they're faced with these kinds of serious things. So again, this is a, a major component of the service that we provide as extension specialists and extension educators. Now, just briefly share with you how I've approached uh, extension and research over the years. Um, the first thing I've done is to try and teach the agronomic fundamentals to farmers and to everyone who works with them, consults with them, advises them throughout Indiana and beyond. Uh, I've tried to conduct relevant agronomic research that addresses problems that my clientele are facing in their day-to-day -day, uh, farming uh, with corn. And then from that research, I've tried to develop and promote sound agronomic guidelines uh, for my clientele across Indiana and the Midwest. And of course, I've tried to pu publish timely advice and observations. And this is different than uh, developing and publishing guidelines. Uh, so much of what we do in extension, especially crops extension, is to get information out that's simply timely. And, and over the years, I've written an awful lot of newsletter articles, and sometimes people tease me about regurgitating articles year after year after year that pretty much say the same thing they did in prior years. But our clientele need to be reminded of some of this timely agronomic information about what happens with the corn crop, what, how does it grow, how does it develop, how is it sensitive to uh, stress at certain times of the year. So this is a, another aspect of what I've done with extension. And then finally, I've always tried to respond to, to uh, phone calls and emails from my clientele and try to respond to them as timely as I can. Because, I mean, you know how it is yourself when you, you call over to, uh, I don't know, I mean, let's say that, you call over to your car dealer and want them to re respond to you and they don't respond to you for four days and you get a little irritated with it. Well, our clientele have the same kinds of issues that uh, if we don't get back and respond to their inquiries as, as rapidly as we can, uh, that's where we begin to lose clientele. So, you know, sort of in a nutshell, this is how I've tried to approach uh, extension and research. Now, just to give you an idea of, of some of the tools that I've worked with, the one thing that I think is safe to say, and, I'm, and, and this is true in the classroom as it is in extension, but there's no single educational tool that has worked for me all the time. And so I've used a lot of tools over the years. Uh, some of them you can call direct contact tools where I'm literally 
face to face in front of people. And so these are one on one kind of, of uh, uh, situations where maybe I'm going out to the farm to help a farmer diagnose a problem. Uh, they might be local county extension programs that may have 10, 20, 30 farmers in attendance. Uh, and then that goes up to multi-county programs where you may have a, a hundred or more in attendance. Uh, statewide programs like the uh, uh, statewide CCA conference that's coming up uh, here in a couple of weeks down in Indianapolis where we might get 600, 700, 800 people in attendance. And then, of course, there's various kinds of multi-state programs or simply programs that are out of state. Uh, for example, I've gone out to Maryland CCA conference quite a few times. I've been to uh, Illinois CCA conference. I've been up on Ontario at their big ag program. Um, and so there's just a number of these tools that I call direct contact, where I'm literally in front of audiences. I can see their faces. I can res They can respond to me. I can respond to them directly. Uh, a lot of opportunities for good education when you're doing those face-to-face -face kinds of, of programs. But there's also almost as many ways to contact or interact with our clientele indirectly. And of course, these include the traditional extension publications that uh, have been around for years and years. Uh, increasingly, over the past 20 years, it's been a greater use of online web resources. Uh, we've always dealt with ag news media. And, and I will say, not just because I see Tom Beckman on, on the, the, the uh, group today, but but one of the things I felt probably really most good about over the years in terms of extension and interactions is that uh, even when I first got here, it was clear that Purdue Extension had a really good relationship with all of the major ag news media outlets in the state. And I really, that has continued all the way to, to this day. And we often talk about multiplying, uh, multiplicative information channels. And, you know, when, when you're dealing with, uh, say, an Indiana Prairie farmer or an Agri-News to, uh, today or those kinds of, of outlets, I mean, now you're talking about reaching thousands, if not tens of thousands of, of clientele by simply interacting and doing interviews with Ag News Media. It's been a, a tremendous resource of contacting people indirectly and continues to be a good resource. Uh, in recent years, of course, we've had an outbreak of social media like Twitter, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about my Twitter experiences here in another slide or two. Uh, we, we've done YouTube videos uh, off and on for some time. I see John Obermeyer's on uh, the group today, and, and of course, John over in Entomology has bugged the devil out of a lot of us for years to uh, do some YouTube videos with him as the cameraman and us as the experts. And yeah, we've done a little bit of that, but I but I will say I've been pretty impressed with the kind of take we get from clientele, especially maybe increasingly in recent years. Um, and then, of course, doing what we're doing today, uh, this this live stream presentations, and you know whether it's Zoom or Microsoft Teams or or whatever. But you know, certainly, if there's any dare I say upside to the pandemic, was that it got a lot of us off of dead center. Uh, to begin using more of these live stream presentation tools, and and you know what I'm using today to do this presentation is is uh, sort of a I'm not sure how I would describe it other than a the streaming tool itself that allows me to be a little more creative when I'm doing these Zoom presentations uh, than I can doing straight Zoom. But you know, so we we have a such a big toolbox of things that we can use in extension, and. Some of them work for particular clientele, some don't. You pick and choose, you sort of figure out what works, what doesn't. To a large degree, you figure out what you're comfortable with. And, and I dare say that, that for things like live stream presentations, even today, this is not my favorite way to be doing a, a seminar or a presentation. Uh, but I will admit after the last almost two years that it can be effective. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities down the road. One of the crown jewels for me over the years in extension was the development of the Crop Diagnostic Training and Research Center, which was launched in 1986. I had the good fortune to be one of the founding fathers of that extension program. And over the years, the DTC developed into what we honestly believe was the nation's premier facility for teaching our clientele 
how to accurately diagnose crop problems in the field, and then what to do about it once they've been diagnosed. It's been a tremendously successful extension program. It's a multi-department, multi-discipline program. Uh, and frankly, uh, it was copied many places around the country uh, after, we, after it was launched and became successful in 1986. Uh, we've branched out into doing publications like the Corn and Soybean Field Guide and the Cover Crop Guide. We've done uh, smartphone or smart device uh, apps like the Corn and Soybean Field Guide. Um, it's been a very tremendously successful program. And, and again, for me, it's been one of the crown jewels of what we've done uh, here at Purdue on, on the crops extension uh, front. For me personally, uh, I got involved with uh, the web back in the pioneer days. Uh, uh, and I, beginning in about 1994, I, I had the one and only vision I've ever had, frankly, of doing extension. And that was this business about creating web pages. And I had a lot of help along the way from some IT people in entomology and some folks down in egg communication. But I went online in 1994 with this thing that I called the Corn Grower's Guidebook. And, and at its simplest, it was simply a website where I tried to gather all the information I could find from not just here at Purdue, but from all over the country, and simply compile it at one web location. Uh, back in the day, this was novel. There, there was really only what I was doing here and what a colleague of mine was doing at Iowa State relative to corn. And, and so, again, I sort of fell into this in, in a way. Uh, it became very successful. It led eventually to the creation of what I called the Chat and Chew Cafe, which was simply a, another website where I uh, aggregated all of the newsletter articles from around the country so that our clientele could simply go to one location and find information from Indiana, from Kentucky, from uh, Ohio, from Pennsylvania, from North Dakota, from almost you name it. And it, it became a very, very successful uh, website. And just to give you an idea, uh, show you the number of page views on, on King Corn uh, during an 11-year period beginning in 2010. And I've got it split into the number of page views from the Chat and Chew Cafe and the number of page views from the rest of the King Corn website. So over that 11-year period, I, I had 2.5 million page views uh, on King Corn itself, and then just the Chat and Chew, I had another million page views. And from what I've been told, that's pretty good paid number of page views, you know, and, and it satisfied the bean counters for quite some time here at Purdue. Um, but there was no question it became a very effective way of doing extension. And now, of course, it's, it's, it's second nature. We don't even think twice about uh, working with the web. But, you know, back in the pioneer days of the mid-90s, this was pretty novel and, and frankly, pretty scary uh, to get into it. But I was fortunate enough that, that it, it became well-known and, and became a, a pretty well-sought-out site. Now, I mentioned Twitter. I am on Twitter. I will frankly say that for me, I, I don't get much out of Twitter personally. Uh, and so I, I've sort of have jump-started couple of times myself getting onto Twitter and using it. But I finally got back onto it uh, oh, about five years ago. And with the idea that my focus was simply going to be to share useful and timely agronomic information. I've got no patience for what I call Twitter fluff. Uh, and, and that's why I don't personally like it myself. But uh, I began to use it. I began to share photos from the field, say, of crop problems. I began to share links to timely information. And for whatever reason, I'm, I've got nearly 6,000 followers, and I've been told that's a pretty good number. I don't know why they like it, but it's okay. I'll, it's another way to hit people. Since 2016, I've averaged about 190 tweets per year myself, which is maybe not as much as our former president, but and I don't know how it compares to other extension specialists, but but those have been the number of tweets per year. And and the number of impressions, which as I understand it is simply whether it showed up on your Twitter feed, uh, is averaging about a little over 600,000 impressions per year uh, since 2016. Now, you know, just because it shows up in your Twitter feed doesn't really mean much from what I can tell. And so what people talk about are 
engagement rates. And as I understand engagement rates, uh, it is whether someone actually clicks on that tweet, maybe click on a photo to look at it, click on a link that I put in it. So to give you an idea of the kind of Twitter engagement rates I had, I pulled up my own data from 2020, but then I pulled up some benchmark data uh, for the uh, alcohol industry, food and beverages industry, higher education in general, and sports teams. And you would sort of think that all four of those would have pretty high engagement rates, right? You would think people would be clicking through those tweets and clicking on images and clicking on links. And yet, according to a data that I found online uh, for, for 2020, uh, the engagement rates for these four industries or, or uh, segments of, of the Twitter world are pretty remarkably low. Now, I'm not saying that what I'm putting out is good information, but my engagement rates for 2020 uh, was 2%. Now, 2% doesn't look like much until you compare it to these big industries that I sort of assumed would have a higher engagement rates. But what this is telling me is indeed what I'm sharing is useful information that they're clicking through to the photos or clicking through to the to on the links that I'm giving them for publications and newsletters and whatnot. And so while I don't personally like Twitter myself, I've decided that many of my clientele do, and so that's why I continue to to do it. And I think has probably gotten me uh, access to more clientele than I would have otherwise. All right. Practical research has been a part of what I've done, uh, and it has involved my own research that I've done around the state um, quite heavily at the Purdue Ag Centers, but also in recent years more on-farm research with commercial growers. Uh, this research has supported uh, the thesis research of, of 27 students that I, graduate students that I've mentored or co-mentored uh, over the years. And so that research that I've done around the state certainly is a big part of the extension uh, information that I share in my extension program. But I'll bring this up, if for no other reason, to remind my younger extension colleagues that what we do in extension is not simply share what we do. Uh, we don't, not just the research that we've done. Uh, it's also our responsibility to share the research from colleagues at Purdue and colleagues at other land-grant universities, especially around the Midwest. And then occasionally we supplement that with research that, that we get from the private sector or, or ag business, in other words. But a big part of what I learned in the early years was that you know what I'm trying to extend to my clientele if I, if I let it uh, simply ride on what I'm doing in my field research, I don't have much of an extension program. But when I can supplement it with research and information from colleagues uh, here at Purdue and elsewhere, that really helps fuel a strong extension program. Now, my own research uh, uh, sort of morphed into field scale research format, uh, oh, maybe five years ago, or well, no more than that, about 15 years ago. Uh, and by field scale research, I mean research trials that range from, say, 30 to 80 acres in size or larger. Uh, individual plots in those trials ranging from 30 to 60 feet wide uh, by length of field. And this background photo is one of our fields down at the southeast Purdue farm. Uh, these are 12 row individual plots and the field length uh, ranges from uh, 1,400 to 2,000 feet long. Uh, we use commercial farming equipment in field scale research, and it's greatly facilitated by the employment and use of precision ag technology. Uh, we use mapping software and GIS to design the plots ahead of time, to collect data, to analyze the data. And I morphed into this uh, beginning around 2006. And the goal of that field scale research uh, has focused on important crop inputs for Indiana corn growers. When Jim Cambrato arrived in 2006, I don't know how we have sort of decided to start doing some of this field scale research, but we began to collaborate. And initially our focus was on identifying economically optimum rates for nitrogen fertilizer and seed 
which at that time were the two most costly variable inputs for corn. Frankly, today they continue to be the two most variable uh, and, and costly variable inputs uh, for that corn crop. And so we focused on those two very important variable inputs, and we did it by doing field scale research. And so since 2006, Jim and I have completed over 250 nitrogen management trials around the state. Uh, and if you, as you look at this map of, of Indiana, uh, the red circles indicate the Purdue Ag Centers around the state, and we've operated and conducted trials at many of them. The yellow counties on the state map are the counties where we've either had Purdue Ag Center trials or where we've had on-farm trials. Uh, we've had about 100 uh, plant population trials since 2006. Uh, in recent years, we focused more on starter fertilizer, uh, biologicals, uh, some of the seed applied or, or furrow implied biologicals, uh, and increasingly uh, trials involving sulfur fertilizer. So a lot of trials that we've conducted since 2006. And it's been supplemented by the on-farm research that we've had, which not only add number of trials or number of site years to the database, but it also enables us to broaden the geographic extent of our efforts. If you look at where the Purdue uh, Ag Centers are around the state, if that's the only place that we conducted research, uh, we'd be missing out on much of the geographic variability, climatic variability, around the state. And so for us, being able to do these field scale trials in collaboration with growers has been a phenomenal asset uh, to our research database and we believe has given us guidelines, allowed us to develop guidelines and recommendations that are much more robust and much more uh, believable. So you know, we've done a fair amount of on-farm research. In fact, of our 250 nitrogen trials, I believe 60% uh, of those have been on-farm. Um, and so sometimes people ask, well, why should farmers collaborate? What do they get out of it? And, and so I've listed a few uh, answers here, a few of the benefits to farmers from collaborating with us on this kind of research. Um, the first one is simply references that Folks who work with us, especially if they collaborate with us over several years, they're exposed to sound research practices in the field. A lot of farmers have the technologies to conduct on-farm research. They've got the machinery, they've got the precision ag technologies, but they don't necessarily have the skill set to do the research. So when they collaborate with us, they get exposed to the kinds of research practices that we believe are sound and reliable, and so in future years, if they decide to go off on their own and do their own on-farm research trials, they little, have a little better skill set to do that. The second bullet is a bit of an ego statement. Um, and, and what I mean by time spent with extension specialists is that when we do this kind of on-farm research, we do spend a lot of time with these growers. We may uh, ride with them during the planting operation. We may ride with them when they uh, put on the nitrogen rates in a trial. We're riding with them at harvest in the combine. And that time spent with us, and frankly, it's a two-way street, um, there's a lot of conversation goes on that has nothing to do with the trials in question. And so uh, we get talking about all sorts of agronomic issues and all sorts of questions that farmers have. And so there is that value, we believe, and in fact, farmers have told us that's a, a benefit to them uh, from collaborating with us. Another benefit farmers have from working with us is they get first look at the research results from their farm. And that's very important to a lot of growers. Uh, and then frankly, we hope uh, more than anything that uh, the biggest benefit to collaborating with us is uh, learning enough uh, that they can improve yield and profit on their farming operation. Uh, I said it's a two-way street that specialists uh, also benefit from collaboration uh, in field scale research. Um, more farmers are willing to collaborate with us because the precision ag technologies we use greatly simplify their logistics of being involved with this research. So they're more willing to work with us. So that's a benefit to us because we can then uh, solicit more growers uh, to work with us. And then the results that we get from field scale research are simply more credible with our farmer clientele. 
um, when I started in, in 1983 with field research. Um, that next winter, sure enough, farmers were sort of poo-pooing results that I was coming uh, getting from small plot work because it you know, wasn't real world in their mind. Um, we know that's not true. We know that's, uh, that's uh, you know, a bit of a misnomer. However, there's no question that results from field skill research are more believable by our clientele. And because of that, uh, the subsequent guidelines we develop are also more credible. And if the guidelines are more credible, it's more likely the farmers are going to adopt them. So it's a huge benefit to us in Extension uh, to be collaborating with growers and doing this kind of field scale research. Uh, you know, briefly in terms of disseminating results, uh, you know, obviously when we're doing on-farm research, we're re uh, reporting the results uh, to the collaborators themselves with their own individual research re reports. Uh, as we get enough data, enough site years, we begin to put together research summaries and eventually guidelines from that research. Uh, we disseminate all of this at extension field days during the summer, winter programs uh, around the state, conferences around the state, and of course our interactions with the farm news media uh, help us get this information out as well as information put on the web, information sent out through Twitter and, and other kinds of, of outlets. So. You know, a big part of what we do as, as extension specialists is to disseminate uh, the results of what we're doing with field research. <clears throat> so I'll, let me take a drink of water and we'll segue to uh, the next part of the presentation. The one thing I really don't like about doing these seminars by Zoom is you're talking to a to the webcam uh, you don't get a chance to stop and breathe and take questions. And so anyway, this was my segue. All right. So I, I just want to say a few things about Extension's role uh, today and tomorrow. And I firmly believe that uh, our, response, our role is to carry on that historical and moral obligation to help improve agricultural productivity profitability, and sustainability by developing practical applications of research knowledge and imparting that knowledge to the best of our abilities. And as my little footnote says, that sort of sounds like what was said in the 1914 Smith-Lever Act. I firmly believe that the thoughts and the goals of that Smith-Lever Act are what we still need to be carrying out today. It's still important today and it will be tomorrow. So that's our role and that's our responsibilities. I believe we can fulfill that obligation by continuing to conduct applied research on topics that are relevant to production agriculture. I believe we can continue to develop educational programs and resources that target a broad base of our clientele around the state. And so we're talking farmers, we're talking crop consultants, we're talking industry agronomists, we're talking county educators. Uh, as broad of a base as we can of the production agriculture uh, as we can get to. And then finally, uh, we need to continue to educate the next generation of agronomic researchers and information providers, which to a large degree is, is a function of the mentoring that we do of graduate students uh, and the research that they do on these relevant topics around the state. And Someone asked me to talk about challenges in the future for extension and research, and the more I thought about it, the more it occurred to me that the challenges we face tomorrow are pretty similar to what we've faced over the past 40 years. Uh, there's never been enough money to conduct research, and I think it's fair to say that today there's even less money available to uh, support practical applied research. And by that, I mean the, the simple kind of research that continues to identify the economic optimum nitrogen rates, the economic optimum seeding rates. Uh, Jim Cambrado and I have a huge database right now, but uh, another five or 10 years, that database is gonna be getting some, uh, some gray hair on it. And somebody, Dan, is going to have to take over and repeat some of this work in five or ten years. And my concern at this point is where are the funds, where are the grant dollars to support this kind of uh, practical applied kind of research. 
Uh, there's not enough dollars to do what we do in extension, and we've seen those dollars shrink uh, over the last uh, so many years. So that will continue to be a, a problem. And then I think these last two are complaints that many of us have had forever. There's not enough resources to do what we do, and there's not enough time in the day. I've joked uh, with people as I've been on this partial retirement program for almost two years now, and on paper, I'm I'm 50% appointment now in my partial retirement career. And and what I've joked with people is that now I get to work 40 hours a week instead of 80. Um, and that's just the way we are in extension. That's the way we are as faculty members in general. And so again, these are challenges, certainly, as we look down the road. But I don't think they're different challenges necessarily. They, they, we've, we've figured out how to... Uh, get by and make do and, and solve them in the past, and I think we'll continue uh, to be able to figure these out. Now, another reality and, and perhaps challenge is that multiple surveys in recent years suggest that extension is not ranked very high by growers. Now, when they're asked, you know, who do they look to for agronomic advice? Who do they trust? And honestly, extension is never ranked very high. Um, and so I took the opportunity to ask some of my colleagues around the country what they thought about this. So I did an informal survey of corn, soybean, and wheat extension specialists around the country. Uh, first question I asked them was, given the private sector's extensive involvement today in providing agronomic information to farmers, do they think, now that, again, I'm asking extension specialists, do they think that agronomic extension programs will be relevant to tomorrow's agriculture, okay? And so I got 35 responses back uh, from uh, colleagues around the country. And most of my colleagues indicate, yes, they believe that, that extension programs will be relevant tomorrow. Some say maybe, a little uncertainty there. None of them said no. Now, that might be job security but by virtue of the fact that none of them said no, but but they, but all of them believe that to some degree, uh, agronomic extension programs will be relevant tomorrow. Now, I think they probably believe that relevance uh, for tomorrow because it's also linked to sort of a common overarching factor, which is maybe a genetic trait of those of us in extension. And that is that we believe that extension's relevance stems from the fact that we provide independent information. Uh, sometimes we say we're, we're unbiased. Well, that's not true. Uh, we're, we are independent, and we are clearly biased by the results of the lab or field research that we do because we believe it's well-designed, we believe it's well-conducted, we believe it's interpreted correctly. So we are biased, but the key thing is our relevance stems from the fact that we are a source of independent information. So then the question, the next question I asked was, can agronomic extension programs remain viable without the collaboration from private industry? And this, these were the responses from my colleagues. A few of us said we can remain viable without collaboration, but the majority of us think some amount of collaboration with the industry will be necessary uh, to remain viable in the future. Now that opinion is interesting, uh, if, if for no other reason, because of how extension specialists often view the validity of agronomic data or guidelines generated by the private sector. Now, at this point, I need to give you a bit of a disclaimer because one of my colleagues even brought this up to me that, you know, what do you mean by private sector? And yes, it means a lot of things uh, from the reputable companies to the snake oil artists. And so, there is a bit of a broad paintbrush being painted when I when I ask these questions about the private sector. So, you know, bear with that uh, as we go through these next few. But my next question was, how often do you question the economic validity of private sector agronomic data or advice? Well, it turns out that we tend to be a little skeptical as extension specialists, and most of us uh, question the agronomic validity of private sector information uh, quite often. And yet, the surveys of our clientele imply that our clientele do not often question that same agronomic data or advice. So here's that bit of disconnect, right? Here, here's this sort of challenge of, 
of you know how do we how do we help growers uh, discern information that they receive from from folks and so as you might imagine the skepticism influences whether we use agronomic data from the private sector in our own extension programming and so I asked the question how often do you incorporate private sector information into your own extension programs and this, these were the results. So in other words, uh, we tend, because we often tend not to believe the validity of what we see, we tend to pick and choose what private sector information we include on our, in our own programs. And so here's the devil in the details then when it comes to collaboration with the private sector in the future because on the one hand, we say we think extension is going to remain viable. On the other hand, we think we're going to need to collaborate with the private sector to, to be, remain viable. Well, that's the devil in the details is that we believe the, the motivation that influences the outreach activities of certain parts of the private sector differs from that of the public sector. And, and I'm going to leave you with that. It's about 20 after or 18 minutes after. Let me just share some final thoughts with you. And, and then if there are questions, uh, we can open up the, the uh, microphones or you can, uh, uh, you can add them to the chat. But it's just some final thoughts. Um, I have always believed and I'll continue to believe that the extension component of our land-grant mission here at Purdue remains important and will continue to be an important function of what we do. For me personally, Extension has been a, a very rewarding career. As some of you know, my graduate school education was in plant breeding, and yet I came out of graduate school, took an Extension specialist position here at Purdue, and I've never looked back. It's been a very rewarding career. Um, I very much enjoyed working with uh, uh, all the farmers, all the ag industry around the state. And maybe because of that, I, I believe that extension can remain relevant to Indiana agriculture in the future, uh, albeit with a few challenges. But again, I don't think these challenges are necessarily insurmountable. I think uh, with a, a sincerity to fulfill the mission, I think we're going to figure out what those answers are. So with that, um, I'll leave you with this quote from Mark Twain that has also uh, driven much of my career. 